Number one, I'm not really convinced that a recession is imminent. This is the business of architecture. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm your host, Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for managing an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. If you haven't already discovered the four pillars of the smart practice, what are you waiting for? Head on over to smartpracticemethod.com for your free on-demand video course. Today we speak with Herbert M. Cannon. Herbert Cannon is one of the nation's leading experts in the management of architecture and engineering firms. He's a former longtime consultant to Robert A. M. Stern Architects, where he helped the firm grow from 150 employees and eight partners to 350 employees and 16 partners. He founded the AEC Management Solutions in 2000 with the simple goal of helping AE firms of all sizes earn and keep the money they deserve by focusing on the specific topics of strategic planning incentive compensation, project management, ownership transition, and financial management and firm valuation. Recently, I invited Herb on to a special training for Business of Architecture audience where we were talking about how to prepare your architectural practice for a recession. There's a lot of talk nowadays of a pretending recession. Right now, everyone's still really busy, but now is the time to start planning for a recession. I'm sure you will find this conversation with Herb Cannon to be extremely valuable. I look forward to your comments and your feedback. And as always, here we go. Let's get right into it. Here is today's show. When, when Enoch asked me to do to do this, um, I, you know, I was thinking, well, you know, what do I what do I really want to talk about here? You know, number one, I'm not really convinced that a recession is imminent. There might be a slowdown. You know, eventually a recession, a, bit, a major downturn will happen. I'm just not personally convinced it's going to happen in the in the short term over the six, next six to 12 months. You know, after all, you know, in the economy, you know, they pumped $5 trillion into the economy. It has to be somewhere, you know? So there's no surprise that there's inflation and there's no surprise in the Fed's reaction to that. So I think what we'll see, I, you know, the supply chain issues are, are clearly still there. I think the housing prices will stabilize, interest rates will go up. But beyond that, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but you know, Time will tell. And I put together this, this presentation, and, and it really is about being prepared. Being prepared when times are good. You know, as Enoch knows, I'm a big fan of, of Tony Robbins. I think I introduced Enoch to, to Tony Robbins. And one of his, his sayings is, you know, when, when times are good, or we, tend to, we tend to party. When times are tough, we tend to ponder. And I think maybe perhaps, hey, the party's a lot of fun. We've been there for a while. Uh, I'm enjoying it. Everybody's in, enjoying the, the, the good economic times. But maybe now is the time to think about what are we going to do if there are some adverse downturns in the economy? So maybe now is the time to ponder, I think, is. You know, and I learned this lesson, or at least I was trying to be taught this lesson when I was nine years old. Now we look, grew up in Rowway, New Jersey, oldest of five boys, always into sports. And we were playing for a, I was playing for in a, in a little league team, very good team. We were way out in front. We, it was the last inning of this game. The bases were loaded. I'm playing third base. All is right with the world, heading towards an undefeated season. The ball was hit to me, right? Now all I had to do was step on third base. But instead, what I did was I picked it up, I fired that baby. I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a frozen rope right to the first baseman. But the first baseman had the back turned. Hit the first baseman in the back, and the first baseman happened to be the, be the coach's son, by the way, uh, just as an aside. And, you know, and everybody looks at me like, you just should have stepped on third base. I was like, you know, so it's like the end of, you're nine years old. Well, you're a, you're a boy. This is the end of the world. This is the end of the world for you. So I, I was unconsolable, and we went on to win the game, and you realize no adverse. Listen, I'm 68 years old. It hasn't damaged me too much, right? It's only 59 <laughs> years ago that it, this, this still sticks with me. But, you know, so my dad says, you know, you know, her, when you're there and the pitch is going, think about what are you going to do if the ball's hit to you? instead of figuring it out after it's hit to you. And I think that's good advice for a nine-year-old. And I think it, 
you know, in a, in a way it's the Boy Scout motto, always be prepared. Be prepared in advance of that adverse event. So I was thinking about what, 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 what should we do, you know? What should we do to prepare is probably all the things we should have been doing all along, right? Running a good, tight, successful business where we're not only looking about what we're doing now, but kind of predicting the future to a certain extent. You know, one of the things that I always liked to do when I was uh, running an architecture firm or the CFO of our architecture firm is how much revenue can we produce with our current staff? Doesn't matter how much, it matters to a certain extent how much work we have coming in, how much revenue we're committed to produce. But if we're committed to produce $100,000 of revenue and we only have enough staff to produce 80, there's a disconnect. And the same thing in the other direction too, there's a disconnect. So we want, we, I always wanted to look at a three months ahead. You know, here we are in August, how much work are we, do we need to produce in September? October and November, according to our current work under contract, plus some reasonable assumptions about weighted average of work coming in. And how much are we capable of producing? So here's, you know, you need to know the numbers to a certain extent, right? It's one thing that we're not very good at in this business, particularly architecture firms, is understanding the numbers behind the business. So here's, a little, I always like to give people a tool to use. Here's something simple, you know, small firms can use, and the, and the, the equation is we're going to take our total salaries, that's our W-2 wages, we're going to multiply it by our utilization rate, by our net multiplier, and that's going to give us our potential revenue production. So what is it, you know, let's talk for a moment, what is our utilization rate? Our utilization rate is what percentage of our labor dollars that we're paying out is dedicated towards producing client-related project work. It's not whether you're a technical staff or an overhead staff. Total W-2 wages, what percentage? Now, I realize that a lot of firms may not have a sophisticated enough tracking system where we're tracking direct labor dollars versus indirect. If you don't have that, you, you, you lose it. Use hours, right? Whatever the hours are. Times our net multiplier. Our net multiplier is how many dollars am I getting back for every dollar that I'm paying someone? If I'm paying somebody $10 an hour and I'm getting back $30 an hour at a billing rate, this is a 30-year bill example, by the way. Um, that's a 3.0 net multiplier. So let's do the math. If you have a $500,000 a year payroll, 65% utilization rate, we're going to have $325,000 of direct labor. If we multiply that by 3.25, we can produce about a million, million fifty-six a year or $88,000 a month. Now, I would do this, particularly when I was with Aaron Krantz and X. Architects, trying to get them turned around, going in a positive financial position. I wanted to make sure that I was able to match as closely as I can my capacity pr to produce versus my, my commitment. So what would it tell us if, it, if $115,000 next month and maybe the month after and the month after that, what decisions, what decisions should I be making? I need to hire more people, right? I better start making offers to people, bringing them in, because I have that committed. I'm committed to get that work. I may also have to get some extensions on work, may need to work some overtime, but it's telling me over the longer term, I do not have enough people for my revenue commitment. On the other hand, if it's 88,000 up here, but I only have 60,000 here, that tells me something also. Maybe I better ramp up my efforts to close the deal and get people to move forward on their, on their commitments with that. Or when I had three offices, I would ask my person in my LA office, DC office, New York office, 
give me the names of the people that we might have to make some staff adjustments a month or so from now. Not that I wanted to, never wanted to do that, but I wanted to make it real. You know, if we went out, we're going to have to cut some people. That's one thing. But when you say, hey, we got to cut Enoch, Carmen, and Herb, that makes it a little bit more real. Makes people go out, close more deals, bring in more work. So that was a tool I found very, very effective for looking forward on what I needed to do. And what about our, well, we do need some ideas to keep our long-term employees. You know, every firm, whether you're a, a seven-person firm or a 70-person firm, you, know, you have that core group. You have a couple of people that are really important to you. And we just can't make them feel important, you know, when, when times are getting tough. We always need to make them feel important. So I always want to make sure we're paying market rate compensation. Another thing that's kind of easy to do that even though it's a real pain is hold your reviews on time. Nothing, few things annoy an employee more than always pushing that back. You know, if you're, you know, if you're scheduled for a review here in August and I have, oh, well, we're busy now or I got this, I got to make this trip. It becomes September, October. Next thing you know, it's the end of the year. We're telling the employees that you were the least important thing. We want to set challenging goals for our employees also when we have that review. And I like to set them as difficult but achievable. Right? I think that's kind of the, the good zone, not, not something impossible. Herb, you've never sold anything before in your life, but you need to go out there and you need to bring in half a million dollars of business next year. That's kind of impossible. Okay, <laughs> maybe a little bit more achievable is, hey, Herb, you know, I know you're doing a good job with getting repeat clients. Sometime in the next six months, six to eight months, I want, I'm going to work with you. We're going to try to get you to bring in a new client on your own. That's achievable. What about incentive compensation? You know, when I talk in my ownership transition seminars, one of the things that I always say, there's no such thing as equal partners. Even if you have three partners and you are each own a third, right? taking the same salaries, same benefits, not everybody's contributing equally. Someone is always contributing more, and the one person is always contributing less. They could change month to month, year to year, but over the long term, there's a pattern there. So where is the equity? in treating the employee compensation side equal to the partner, to your ownership percentage. There is no equity. And maybe we can think about the same thing with our employees. Have some sort of incentive plan where we, we're rewarding them for the financial results they're achieving on our behalf. Since I do so much work on ownership transition, incentive compensate um, valuations and ownership transitions probably 80 percent of the work that i do now um you know one of, one of the, the things that i like to, to do is you know if you have a really valuable employee it might be to your benefit to get them involved with some level of ownership early on you know if you're really afraid that they're going to leave what would i do if this person left don't wait till they're leaving to get them involved with some sort of incentive plan or ownership. Think about that now. You know, a lot of the people that I deal with are owners of firms. They're, 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 they're planning their retirements. They're planning their retirement strategy. Yeah, Herb, I want to, you know, start, start, you know, selling in, in two or three years. I have a couple people that are really, really key. You know, I've mentioned it to them already. So sell them some now. It's a sign of good faith on your part that your intentions are true. So let's get them involved with a little bit of ownership earlier rather than later. Uh, more likely to stay with you. And if you're ultimately looking to actually to sell to the outside, it makes you much more attractive as an acquisition candidate. Because they know the, the old guy, Herb, he's going to be leaving. What do we have in ownership behind him for the longer term? So there's just some ideas for keeping
keep people with your firm a little bit. Keep them from leaving. Everybody's poaching everybody's clients, you know? What are we gonna do about it? Anyway, those are just some, some ideas that I wanted to share with you today. Um, I'm used to doing three hour webinars, seven hour seminars. So I just try to condense a few things down here to give you a few, few things to think about, one tool that you can use to kind of predict your future a little bit. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.